Hello, I'm April Bo Wong, and I am excited to join this evening's event from the GBH education team. Um, thank you all for joining us for our 11th edition of our monthly Beyond the Page book club. Today, I will be joined by Emily Henry, author of People We Meet on Vacation. Um, and special shout out to the Boston Public Library who assisted us in securing tonight's author for us. Um, also, a thank you to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, one of my favorite local venues, who partnered with Beyond the Page Book Club on this event. Trident is open for dining and browsing 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. Um, you can visit their website to shop online 24-7. So before we dive into this tonight's event, I want to explain how this will work. You will not see yourself on video and you will not be able to speak during the author interview, but we do want to hear from you. So you can ask questions by opening up the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. You can put your questions in at any point in time during my interview with Emily, and I'll do my best to address them as they make sense during the interview. Um, you do not need to wait for the second half of the event to input your questions. Feel free to get started now. Um, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up and move it up to the top of the list. Um, we will do our best to ask the most popular questions. So Zoom has recently rolled out an automated captioning feature and we are excited now to be able to offer this so that everyone can enjoy our events. Um, to turn on the closed captioning feature, um, you'll see that there's a live transcript um, button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription displays options will pop up. We recommend that you can select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also select full transcript a sidebar window opens where you can see what each speaker is saying. Um, and please bear in mind that closed captioning might be a little bit delayed. And finally, we will also be asking you before we start our conversation if you finish the book. So look out for um, a poll question to pop up on your screen in just a few minutes. Um, and I'm already seeing lots of questions come into the Q&A, so thanks. Keep them coming. Um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce Emily Henry. Emily Henry is the number one New York Times bestselling author of People We Meet on Vacation and Beach Read, as well as several young adult novels. She lives and writes in the Cincinnati and the part of Kentucky, in Cincinnati and the part of Kentucky just beneath it. Her books have been featured in BuzzFeed, Oprah Magazine, Entertainment Weekly, The New York Times, The Skim, Shondaland, Betches, Bustle, and more. Find her on Instagram at Emily Henry Writes. So Emily, I understand that you would like to start by reading um, a passage and I'm very excited for this. So take it away. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna be reading from the first chapter of the book. So anybody who hasn't finished, don't worry about that. Um, and this, you know, the first chapter is five years before the main events of the book and Poppy, the main character has just come out of a disgusting bar bathroom. Um, okay. In a sticky floored bar called Only Bar, I scour the meager crowd for my target. He's sitting at the corner of Bar's bar itself, a man about my age, 25, sandy haired and tall with broad sh shoulders, though so hunched you might not notice either of these last two facts on first glance. His head is bent over his phone, a look of quiet concentration visible in his profile. His teeth worry at his full bottom lip as his finger slowly swipes across the screen. Though not Disney World level packed, this place is loud. Halfway between the jukebox crooning creepy late 50s tunes and the mounted TV opposite it, from which a weatherman shouts about record-breaking rain, there's a gaggle of men with identical hacking laughs that keep bursting out all at once. At the far end of the bar, the bartender keeps smacking the counter for em emphasis as she chats up a yellow-haired woman. The storm's got the whole island feeling restless and the cheap beer has everyone feeling rowdy. But the sandy haired man sitting on the corner stool has a stillness that makes him stick out. Actually, everything about him screams that he doesn't belong here. Despite the 80 something degree weather and 1 million percent humidity, he's dressed in a rumpled long sleeve button up and navy blue trousers. He's also suspiciously devoid of a tan as well as any laughter, mirth, levity, etc. Bingo. I push a fistful of waves out of my face and set off toward him. As I approach, his eyes stay fixed on his phone, his fingers slowly dragging whatever he's reading up the screen. I catch the bolded words, chapter 29. He's fully reading a book at the bar. I swing my hip into the bar and slide my elbow over it as I face him. Hey, tiger. His hazel eyes lift to my face, blink. Hi. Do you come here often, I ask? 
He studies me for a minute, visibly weighing potential replies. No, he says finally, I don't live here. Oh, I say, but before I can get out any more, he goes on. And even if I did, I have a cat with a lot of medical needs that require specialized care, makes it hard to get out. I frown at just about every part of that sentence. I'm so sorry, I recover. It must be awful to be dealing with all that while also coping with a death. His brow crinkles. A death? I wave a hand in a tight circle, gesturing to his getup. Aren't you in town for a funeral? His mouth presses tight. I am not. Then what brings you to town, I ask? A friend, he says, eyes dropping to his phone. Lives here, I guess? Dragged me, he corrects, for vacation. He says this last word with some disdain. I roll my eyes. No way, away from your cat? With no good excuse except for enjoyment and merrymaking? Are you sure this person can really be called a friend? Less sure every second, he says without looking up. He's not giving me much to work with, but I'm not giving up. So, I forge ahead, what's this friend like? Hot, smart, loaded? Short, he says, still reading. Loud, never shuts up, spills on every single article of clothing either of us wears, has horrible romantic tastes, sobs through those commercials for community college, the ones where the single mom is staying up late at her computer, and then when she falls asleep, her kid drapes a blanket over her shoulders and smiles because he's just so proud of her. What else? Oh, She's obsessed with shitty dive bars that smell like salmon salmonella. I'm afraid to even drink the bottled beer here. Have you seen the Yelp reviews for this place? Are you kidding right now? I ask, crossing my ar arms over my chest. Well, he says, salmonella doesn't have a smell, but yes, Poppy, you are short. Thank you so much, Emily. Yeah. Um, that was great. And I, <laughs> you know, this is a great segue to my first question. Um, which is, I believe this passage is pretty near the beginning of the book and already there's just so much character about these two people. Um, Alex, the book, the lack of tan, the lack of birth, the cat. <laughs> the cat is my absolute favorite. Um, but um, how do you, what is your process for character development? It's, it's really interesting. Sorry, I'm trying to move this pole away from your face. I'm not, all right, I'm back, okay. Um, so, it's a little bit different for every book, but this book was really rare and special in that the first scene in the book, which is what I was reading from, I didn't start at the very beginning, but it was the first scene. Um, that was the first scene that I had in my mind for the book. I wasn't, you know, writing towards something else I was excited about, which is often what happens is I have an idea for a premise and it kind of has a couple of scenes connected to it that are later in the book. But for this book, I knew instantly that it was going to start in this way with this sort of misdirection. Um, and I, I don't do a ton of, you know, pre-planning when I draft, I don't outline, I don't make character sheets or anything like that. And so normally when I'm drafting, I use my first drafts to get to know my characters and I don't really know them at all until the end of the first draft. And so by the time I get there, I realize, you know, a lot has to change in the book because the characters aren't making decisions they would make or they're not speaking how they would speak or whatever, just all the details will change by the time I finally understand them. And so then in my second drafts, I'm a lot of what I'm doing is I'm rewriting so that the characters are who I have figured out that they are. But with this book, it was so weird because this scene was the first thing that came to me when I kind of had the premise for the book in my head. And that's why it's the only scene that's sort of out of the chronological order. Um, the rest of the book is you know, following this present day trip in order and then all of their previous interactions in order. But this one's this just kind of little chunk from kind of the, the golden days of their friendship. Um, and, and I, it just is so weird. I mean, as soon as I had the scene, I knew who they were so thoroughly and that hasn't happened for me ever before. And I am now terrified it will never happen again because it's <laughs> just like, it makes everything so much easier when you know them that well, because the, the dialogue just happens. You know how they'll reply to everything that the other one says and you know what they're gonna wanna do in each city and and all of those details. And you know, I didn't, I didn't know exactly what Alex and Poppy's family lives would be like or their childhoods when I started writing it. Um, so there are some details that got threaded through in later drafts that, that I didn't actually know until later in the first draft, but it was sort of like, I got to the point, you know, where now suddenly it was like, okay, yeah, I should have Poppy, I should have Poppy's family on page and I should have Alex meet them and see how she, how she deals with that. And I hadn't really thought too much about what her parents were like. And then it's like, I wrote that scene and instantly it was like, oh, I know what Poppy's parents are like. I know where she comes from. I know that she has two older brothers. And it just was like the blissful writing experience that will never be recreated. And 
yeah, I mean, they just, I, I've never had that so clearly with two characters where it just felt like they were real to me from the very beginning. That's amazing. Um, and just, I know that you, you said that they felt like immediately, um, known to you yeah. but was there one character Alex or Poppy that came more quickly and the other character became built around that person or? wow that's such a good question I'm trying to think so so one of the earliest kernels of this book was was the desire to write an homage to when Harry met Sally and I also knew that it was going to be set across vacations um and so I was taking those two ideas and I and I guess when I kind of pitched it to my agent and my editor the way that I described it was a millennial gender swapped when Harry met Sally. And so just from the very beginning, I knew I wanted Poppy to be the one who was like a little bit more abrasive and like a little bit more obnoxious. And I wanted Alex to be the one who's, you know, a little bit annoyed by her at first and thinks she's too much. And I also knew I wanted Alex to be the one who is in the beginning, at least, you know, like a little bit more of a romantic in some ways, but also a little bit more logical. Like he he he's looking for um companionship and like a lasting relationship and he he craves this like steadiness whereas poppy is you know almost clinical in the way that she approaches her mm -hmm. love life for most of the book where she just meets someone and she's like they're interesting i will date them um no mm -hmm. you know no preconceptions about what the end goal is with that or you know not looking to settle down um so i knew that I wanted, you know, sort of a staid male lead and then a kind of wild child is how we ended up describing Poppy in the uh, cover copy. So I knew I wanted those two things, but I think a lot about, I think it was Kazuo Ishiguro who said that he's not really interested in writing characters so much as he is in writing relationships. And I think I've never felt that more than when I was writing this book because the whole conceit of it was if I take these two characters and I put them in all of these different places and you know there are different people coming in and out and you know you see them with their families all of that the whole the whole conceit and the reason I was excited to write it was the thought of like people are different with different people and different people bring out different sides of you in different places and different jobs and all of that and so the idea of having 12 years to write these characters and see how they are in different situations and when different people come on page and when they're in different cities was really fun to me because it was a way to show how many how much overlap there is between the two of them and how many ways they do fit and how many different versions of each other they get to know over the years um so i don't think that there was i don't think there was ever really just one who i was like oh this this is who i'm kind of building everything around because i think i knew from the very beginning I was chasing this really particular dynamic and I knew that that was, I could just imagine that dynamic. I mean, I think, you know, Poppy is sort of, she's a, a youngest child with two older brothers, which I'm a youngest child with two older brothers. And she knows kind of how to have that sort of relationship of being like the little sister. Like that's kind of how she operates and interacts with people. And Alex is an oldest child with um, younger siblings who he was sort of a caretaker for. So he knows how to be, you know, the responsible, um, reliable one who can just make sure nothing's like on fire. And I, I knew that it would be really fun to put those two characters together and have her bring out, you know, poke and prod and bring out these other sides of him. Um, and yeah, I think that the joy of Poppy really is, I don't think I would like Poppy quite as much without an Alex to, to see, you know, what she, what she brings out in him and what she opens up of him. That's like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see that he, no one else would see that with Alex. Only Poppy can kind of bring that out of him. That's um, great. And just, just so you know, you already answered one of the questions in the chat, which was um, when you talked about it being this book being an homage to when Mary met Sally, people were interested in whether that was a, that was a yeah. thing. But I also think the thing that you say about people being taking on different characters or personalities or, or however in different um, places is really interesting. And you write with such gorgeous detail about so many places that Alex and Poppy visit on their vacations. Um, have you visited any of these places yeah. in the book? Yeah, I so I chose the trips that Poppy and Alex go on based on places that I had been because I I mean the whole, the the way that this book came to be the the way that I ended up writing a book set across this series of vacations was that I was trying to just nail down one setting for a book and knew I wanted it to be like a summary fun like you know escapist kind of read um but all of the settings that I was kind of 
toying with the idea of writing about were all places I had gone for trips, not anywhere that I had lived. And there are some authors who are so good at research and they can really, you know, get into a place, even if they've never been there and make you believe that they know it, you know, forwards and backwards. But I, I think I just am really paranoid about somebody like reading a place and being like, well, I live there and it's nothing like that. Um, or like, you know, Alex and Poppy go to New Orleans and what they do is they go to Bourbon Street because they're tourists. And that's what I did in New Orleans. I didn't know how to find like the cool places that like local New Orleansers, whatever, <laughs> however you say that would, would go to. So I, I basically was like, okay, I'm going to write about these places. Um, but I only really know enough about each of them to write from the perspective of a visitor. I couldn't, I couldn't write them as a local. And so that's how the book came to be across all of these trips. And then the trips themselves were, you know, chosen based on places that I had traveled. The one exception is the main, you know, present day storyline that's set in Palm Springs. I haven't been to Palm Springs since I was very little. Um, and when I wrote the book, you know, I was doing a ton of online research and I fully planned to then also be able to take a trip and like corroborate everything and maybe add in some details for my own trip that would kind of, that I wouldn't have thought to come up with whatever. Um, and then COVID hit and that didn't happen. And so it was just a lot of, a lot of research. And luckily with the internet being what it is, there are so many, like so many documented vacations <laughs> in the universe <laughs> that you have access to. It's like, you don't have to just read um, a travel magazine and, and get that perspective. You can really find out very small details. Like in, um, in the book when they go to, they go to like the living desert zoo and there's a carousel that isn't open because it's too hot. And like the metal gets too hot. And that's like a real thing that like they close this carousel at certain times in the summer because the metal could burn you. Um, or there's, there's a botanical gardens that they try to go to and they realize that it like closes pretty early in the morning because those are the only hours when it's really safe to be out in the heat for like, you know, two hours at a time. So there were a lot of things like that, um, that I luckily was able to find online, but that was the only trip that I have not personally taken. Um, and related to that, so we know that some of the places you've been, most of the places you visited, what about the disasters that happen <laughs> in vacation in this, in this yeah. book? Are they, are they related on your own experiences? I think, I think everybody who's used Airbnb has had like the nightmare Airbnb to some extent. Usually it's just like you show up and it's filthy. And I feel like that's like bad enough when you're like, my mess is one thing, but to come to a, a stranger's house and just like pull the bedding back and there's just like hair in the bed that I'm about to sleep in is not a good time. Um, I'm trying to think specifically, I will say, so the, um, the air conditioning that's broken in the Palm Springs uh, Airbnb, um, the way that they have to kind of like turn it down one degree at a time and kind of wait for the air conditioning to meet that and then bump it down again, that is based on my own personal air conditioning in my home, um, which <laughs> we figured out through trial and error that like, if we turn it down more than one degree, you know, it, it would start climbing and it's funny because since then I've gotten some messages from people um, on Instagram who've said that they were having their air conditioning was struggling with the heat wave and they tried that and it worked for them. So it isn't just my wonky air conditioning, apparently. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I'm sure that there are others that made it in. Um, there was like the real, I think that there's like a very small detail in the um, Vancouver Island trip where when they go to Tofino and, you know, take the water taxi and all of that, they're kind of meeting other young people and the young people are like, where are you staying? And they tell them where they're staying and they're like, that's like a retirement community. <laughs> that's all old people. And that was a real thing that happened. My husband and I went to Vancouver Island for our honeymoon and we didn't know like the difference between the coasts and we kind of just picked a town at random and we had a great time, but it was really funny because we were just sort of like, there, there's not really anything here and everything closes really early. And then when we drove over to Tofino to do this water taxi um, ride, we like met a bunch of other young people and they were like, really, what made you, st what made you choose there instead of like this side of the island? Um, so there were tons of tiny little details like that that got threaded through. But it was funny because I, I really thought I was going to be writing this book where people 
were taking these really, you know, luxurious vacations and everything was like perfect and aspirational and glossy and shiny. And then when I started writing it, I realized I was having so much more fun writing things going very badly. And I realized that when I think back on like a lot of my favorite trips, there are the really, you know, magical mo unexpected moments that you think about too, where it's like, oh, we met this person and they told us to go to this restaurant. And then we got like this free bottle of wine. All of that stuff is really fun and magical, but you also really remember the things that went wrong, especially if you're with someone who you have a good time with. It always ends up being funny, like as you kind of recover. I mean, yesterday I'm, I'm visiting my, my family out West and it's really lovely and wonderful. But yesterday, um, my husband was opening a, a bottle of beer and the bottle of beer just broke in his hand and he just cut open his hand. We were like, okay, well, we're going for you to get stitches. Um, and then it was like the next four hours of our day were just like an urgent care and stitches. And in like, just, a, I don't know, just those little things that make a life feel lived in. I think, I think when you feel like characters are very real, it's because there are these almost unnecessary details, but you're just like, oh yes, that would happen. That would happen to me. I would be on vacation and I would, you know, like Poppy twisting her ankle and then crying about her hands. I think maybe something very similar to that mm -hmm. happened to me because that was just so clear in my memory or my in my mind when I was writing it. I think that once when I was emotional, I was like, do I have weird hands? Um, <laughs> so yeah, a lot of a lot of little details make it in. That's that's great. Um, and just a quick note to the audience, if you're just joining us, welcome. We're continuing a conversation with New York Times bestselling author Emily Henry. Um, as a reminder, if you do want to ask Emily questions, use the Q&A tab that's located in the toolbar on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions um, in the second half of this evening's event. So back to you, Emily, thinking about those things that you're not like, oh, I could do that. Which of the characters are you most like? Oh, yeah, it's it's so interesting because I have only written like one or I've only published one book where I'm like the character I wrote is nothing like me. And almost every other time I write a book, I, I set out thinking I'm like, I'm finally doing it. I'm writing a character I have nothing in common with. And by the end, it always feels like so exposing. And you're just like, oh, no, I did it again. <laughs> I wrote myself again. But they all are just like different pieces, because again, like people are not characters. People are really complicated and they act different with different people. And, you know, they don't do exactly what you would expect them to do. And, and for a book to feel more believable, I sort of feel like you have to have the character just like really like of a piece in a way that I don't think humans actually are. Um, but with Poppy and Alex, I, I think outwardly I am 100% Poppy and then inwardly I'm like, 75% Alex, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is like, I am, you know, I am always in my, like a, a kind of like prison of my own making in my brain. And then outwardly, I'm just like, and let's, you know, go bar hopping with a hundred people. So, um, I have definitely, obviously I have read a book at a bar, but like who has it, who among us has not done that. Um, but I do not own khakis like Alex. And I definitely, um, I'm, I'm a little bit more of a little bit more chaotic. I am not clean and tidy like Alex. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm just, I just kind of have his anxiety and his, um, his bookishness. And other than that, I'm mostly poppy. Thank you. Um, and it seems like a lot of people like me want to see the movie. Um, so if this were a movie, who would you cast as Alex and Poppy? Oh my gosh. I actually love to, um, have other people tell me that because I don't imagine actors as my characters. I don't really imagine them at all. It's act I've, I've recently realized I don't actually picture characters when I'm writing or when I'm reading. And like, I have a general hair color in mind maybe. Um, <laughs> but when people have asked, I like kind of my default answer have, has been for Poppy either like Mae Whitman or Jane Levy because they're both just like about the right age and they're small and they're, you know, just perky and fun. Um, somebody said, somebody suggested, um, I just keep wanting to say her Big Little Lies character's name. Oh, um, Zoe Kravitz for Poppy. And I've never seen Zoe Kravitz do anything like peppy, but I think that would be really fun to see if she could do something like, you know, where she's just like a little bit more peppy and less just like cool laid back girl. Um, for Alex, a couple of the ones that I've really liked, someone said 
Joe Alwyn, which I thought like was a kind of physical match ish to the, how Alex is described. Someone said Dev Patel, which I thought could be really like perfect. Possibly. I think he would be like very good at being kind of, you know, buttoned up and repressed, but secretly Absolutely. just very hot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I always say like, I don't need the, because I don't even really picture my characters. I don't need actors to look anything like my characters. If an adaptation gets made, I just want them to really have that dynamic and that personality. So hopefully someday we'll have news about that. And right now, you know, things are always out of the author's control and move very slowly, but I'm crossing my fingers that something does happen on that front. Awesome. Um, so a little segue into craft questions. Yeah. What is the best piece of writing advice you've received that you still use in your own writing? That is, oh my gosh, it's so hard because, it's so hard because writing advice is, just really far from being one size fits all. And so anything anyone says to you either works or it doesn't. And that's like as much as weight you, as you should give it. Um, for me specifically, I wrote my first novel length thing. It was a novel um, in college. I took a novel writing class and we ha just had to finish the book. It just, it, it could be horrible. We weren't getting graded on if it was good. We were getting graded on if it existed. And we did it with like the national novel writing month format, meaning we wrote 2000 words a day for a month and had 50,000 words, um, slightly less than 2000 words. But um, yeah, I mean, my professor just wanted everybody to write and not self edit and not go back and change anything and kind of just leave comments as they were working. So like you get to the end of a draft and you know what you need to do, but you're not slowing yourself down with self-editing and doubt. And that's still how I write. So that for me works really, really, really well. And I do have friends who don't work that way at all. Um, one of my closest friends um, is a writer as well. And she, she painstakingly writes every single sentence. And we co-wrote a book together called Hello Girls. It's like our YA, Thelma and Louise. Um, but Honestly, I don't even think it should be YA. So just scrap that. It's a book for adults about teenagers getting into trouble. But anyway, but we were writing in a Google document together and I would watch her work and I would just watch her write a sentence one way and then backspace and she would write it a different way and backspace. And I would just watch her perfect every sentence and, you know, and then move on. And the way that I would work would be like, I just write really, really fast. <laughs> it's just like filling up the page. The writing is horrible but I'm getting it on to the page. And then later I come back in and rewrite everything. So that is really helpful, practical advice for me is just to have that word goal. You, you get it every day that you sit down to do it. Even if it's terrible, you don't worry, you don't self edit. That frees me up from thinking, is this good? Which I think is like the worst question, question you can ask yourself when you're making anything is like, is this good? Um, or even like, is this bad? Which is even worse. So for me, that really works, but it's like everybody has to do their own thing. And I think the biggest advice that I give out aside from that really is just um, that, you, that your value, it's, it's just the same thing as like being a human on the planet where like you have to learn to trust in the value of something regardless of what anyone else says. And that's like a really weird counterintuitive thing because you're constantly kind of saying, is this good? Like, I feel like when you're making art, you're just kind of walking around, holding it up to people and being like, is this good? Like, am I worthy? Is this worthy? And it's really confusing because writing is an art and publishing is a business. And so you can kind of get into the habit of like, oh, this is good because it's selling really well. Um, but I just got an email that my, one of my YA novels is they're, they're remaindering it, meaning they didn't sell very many and they're pulping the rest of them because they need more storage space and my books aren't selling. And it would be so easy for me to think like this book is good and that book is bad. And I've had to really work very hard to trust myself. And that's a really weird thing when you're pursuing publishing um, because you also wanna be taking people's advice and like, you know, incorporating it and being ready to grow and all that. But I think um, there's, it's like weird because it's like you need to learn to take criticism but you also really have to learn to trust yourself and your gut and to believe in the value of what you're making and to not go like chasing trends and markets. So that's. A very, 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 very long answer to a quick question. 
No, I mean, I, that's so interesting. And I, what you're saying about writing as an art and publishing is a, a business yeah. um, and that you shouldn't change trends. Like I had two questions is yeah. what subgenre would you categorize people we meet on mm -hmm. vacation? And then do you think about when you're writing a book like this, what are like tropes or trends in this kind of area? And what do you want to lean into and what do you want to stay away from as you write? Yeah, that's th those are great questions. So first I will say, I think people we meet on vacation is sort of like the bait and switch book. And I actually think that's why it has worked so well and sold so well. I think uh, more seasoned romance readers will pick it up and it might not like have the steam that they prefer or whatever, but it's, you know, got the angst and the pining and whatever. Um, and then I think general fiction or women's fiction readers will pick it up and be like, you know, I like a love story. Why not? Um, but I'm, I'm pretty adamant about claiming it as a romance novel and it's fine to me if other people don't I think there are romance readers who who like my books okay but are like but this shouldn't be classified as romance and that's fine but I'm adamant about claiming it as romance because I think it's just a part of and sorry if you can hear a little poodle barking in the background <laughs> um it's just a part of me trying to um show that I'm like very proud of writing what I write and you know the romance genre has been looked down on for so long and um, disparaged and I think there is no part of me that wants to be oh, I see a message that somebody has a poodle sorry um anyway um <laughs> yeah yeah so I think I claim it as romance for that reason I think it could just be shelved as fiction and that would be fine um but I do I do think about romance tropes when I'm writing and really the only thing that I think about with it is what do I like? And I think that there's a natural subversion that happens if you're thinking like, what do I like in a book? But then also you're really thinking about your characters and you're really just thinking, you know, um, about how they would, how they would do this version of a trope. And so like, you know, with people we meet on vacation, it's like a, will they, won't they like possible friends to lovers situation. And that was like, you know, the when Harry met Sally of it all, um, and I had never written like a friends to possible lovers relationship and was excited by that challenge and didn't really know if I could carry it off. And there's also sort of like the one bed trope if for anyone who's like a, a more seasoned romance reader or even a romance reader at all, we all know the one bed trope. Um, and I was really excited for that because I love that. I know some people don't like it. I love that trope, but I thought it would be really funny to see it work a little bit differently. That moment of like Alex and Poppy getting to their Airbnb and Poppy thinking, oh no, there's one bed. And then it's like, there's not one bed. There's just only one reasonable bed, which is again, totally a thing that happens with Airbnbs. You're like, how did you photograph this to make this room four times larger than it is? And like, this bed is a double bed and it looked like a king. Um, so yeah, I mean, to me, it's like, I really just think about what I like and there are tropes that I like, but it's, I don't really like, I think it's fun to subvert tropes, but it's not, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like I'm taking something that I think is like boring or cliche. It feels like I'm playing in, in a, in a sandbox that I really enjoy as a reader too. And so it's like, I'll, I'll see what my version of that thing is. Thank you. And I will just say when they do have to, you know, share the bed and his like back is like broken. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's just, it's so great. Um, <laughs> So we have a lot more questions, yeah. but I do want to take a break and hear from um, Amy Reese about how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only beyond the page, but all the virtual events we continue to provide. So Amy, welcome. Thank you so much. And hello to everybody at home who is joining us for our latest installment of Beyond the Page. Now I say this all the time, but it's always so great to see a community of people brought together by a great story. And let's face it, who doesn't have a little, you know, time for, for more romance in their lives? And this is a great book for that. Well, if you enjoyed tonight's Beyond the Page event, then we ask you to please consider making a donation to GBH. Are you a GBH sustainer? Do you know what a GBH sustainer is? Well, if not, I'm going to tell you because sustainers are very important. A GBH sustainer serves as a steady and reliable ongoing source of support for GBH. And that allows us to keep your favorite programs and the news online and on the air. I mean, you watch and listen to GBH throughout the year. So it makes sense to spread out your support for GBH throughout the year as well. And it's so easy to do. 
Today, if you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, we will send you a copy of next month's featured book, which is called When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. Uh, and, or if you're in the mood for another great read by Emily, we could also send you an autographed copy of another one of her novels called Beach Read, which is also amazing. So how do you get these autographed books? All it takes is a donation of $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once. Whatever works for you and your wallet. It's really easy and secure. Just click on that link you see in your Zoom chat now, which is gbh.org slash support events, or you can text GBH without the W, just GBH to 800-204-3811. That's 800-204-3811. All it takes is a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit or debit card each month. So everybody at home, one more time, please help us present more stories during the On The Page events or on your TV or on the radio. And if you're already a member, we always thank you so much for support. And uh, we hope to see you all again in August during our next Be On The Page event. So until then, happy summer reading. And now I'll give it back to April and Emily. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so it's time to continue our discussion with Emily. Um, and please keep the questions coming. And remember to use the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom bar. Um, no need to wait. Just jump right in and ask your questions. Um, so Emily, one of the big questions from Lisa um, is, how did you choose the title? And at what point in the writing process did you choose it? Yeah, so People We Meet on Vacation was actually, so I'll back up. When I kind of was setting out to write my follow-up to Beach Read, I had a lot of input from my editor and my agent because they're both super smart and they just, we have like a hive mind situation. And so we wanted to make sure that the next book was like the perfect next book to do. Um, and so we went through probably like a hundred pitches and a lot of them were just really like a scrap of like, I would wake up in the middle of the night and type into my phone, like macaroni store or something like that. And then in the morning I'd be like, send my list of 20 new pitches to my editor. And one of them would be like, does macaroni store make you think of anything? Um, and none of them were quite that bad, but it was a lot of things like that. And one of the more slightly more developed developed pitches that I had um, was for a book called People We Meet on Vacation. And it was going to be set at like a little resort that was run by a family. And so it was going to be featuring kind of the people who they were meeting there. Um, and we talked about that idea for a little bit and it just didn't end up feeling quite right for a couple of reasons. It didn't really feel like the perfect next book. And when I had the idea for this, what turned out to be people we meet on vacation, I sent my agent an email and was basically like, I'm scared this might be the last idea I ever have because we've just been trying for so long. And, you know, we're, we're down to like macaroni store ideas at this point. And I had this final idea that I really liked, but I also was like, but I feel like this is it. Like I'm really out of books. Um, and luckily my agent really liked it. We sent it to my editor and she really loved it. And we talked about it a little bit more. And we remembered that we had really liked this title for a different project and had kind of, when we were talking about this new idea, we were like, that actually really works. And then when I was thinking about my kind of loose plan for Poppy and Alex, I knew exactly what it would mean in the context of their relationship and how it would kind of drive the story. And that was like, we were talking about the idea that it's, I mean, you know, they meet people on their trips, but it's much more about all these different versions of each other that they collect over the years and how they have all these little puzzle pieces and become kind of each other's most important person because they're sharing these pieces of themselves that no one else gets to see. And so before I wrote a single word, before this concept even existed, this title was sort of floating out there and we knew we liked it. Um, and then when, when the characters of Poppy and Alex came to be in my head, I just, like, like I said, I knew exactly 
why this title worked for them. And um, yeah, was like totally happy to write into the title, to like write toward it. Right toward it. Um, that's great. So uh, a theme that came up a lot throughout this book, beyond all the complexity of um, Alex and Poppy's relationship and their romantic tension, was um, their conflicting um, relationship with their hometown in Ohio. Um, and question from Elizabeth, are you from the same area as Poppy or Alex? And to, to extend that, um, do you fall somewhere on the Alex or Poppy spectrum? Ooh, in your wow. That's a great question. I am. So Alex and Poppy are from like a fictionalized version version of the town where I went to high school. And it, you know, it was a really big, it was like a really big town with two high schools, like where Poppy and Alex um, ha went to high school. But I, I wasn't really Poppy or Alex because I, I think because I moved there right before high school. And so I didn't really have time to have like developed a lot of trauma or like made a ton of friends either it was just sort of like a new person who no one knew was a new person because there were so many kids at the school um so yeah I think I think I do relate to Poppy in that I wanted I wanted to get out in some ways um I didn't have like the same exact you know childhood or trauma or you know bullying issues or whatever I was just sort of like a no one in my mind at least in high school and I wanted to get out and just I don't know I think I don't know I think a lot of people can relate to the kind of embarrassing feeling of like your late teens of er and early 20s where it's like you just want so badly to be interesting <laughs> and like a lot of times you just don't feel interesting because people are more or less the same I think and um, I think some of it, it's like Poppy's whole journey is she's kind of trying to say like constantly, this is who I am. This is who I am. I'm this person. I'm this person. Um, and in, in her world, it's sort of to combat the messaging that she had as a kid and to be like, I'm not that Poppy that people said I was, I'm this Poppy. And I think so much of your like late twenties and early thirties, and maybe beyond that is just sort of settling down and being like, I don't really need people to see me in any particular way. I can just be me and that's fine. And so I think I really, I relate to Poppy in that I think I was a person who very much wanted like a clear firm identity. And mm -hmm. a lot of my decisions were based in trying to build that identity. Like whether that was like how I was doing my hair, how I was dressing, um, my hobbies, the music I listened to, all of it was sort of trying to curate like myself and be like, this is who I am. Um, so yeah, I think I relate to that. And, and I didn't, I don't hate my hometown. I don't like look, I do look back on high school with some fond memories and some like, ugh. so kind of in between. Um, and we've talked a lot about Poppy and Alice, but also have some questions about secondary characters yeah. and specifically Swapna. Marie says she is scary to me. Did you intend her to be unlikable? Oh my gosh. No, I love Swapna. I think that's really funny that she's scary. I mean, she would be scary if she were your boss, she would be scary. But I think the thing with Swapna, the reason, the thing that I love about her is she is sort of just like this boss bitch where she's like, yeah, she's like got the blunt haircut and the stilettos and like is really in control. But I always knew I wanted her to be a mentor figure for Poppy. And I knew I wanted her to be like intimidating and a little bit, a little bit scary to the people who work for her because she's just so good at her job and so put together. But I, I always wanted it to be clear that she is rooting for Poppy and that she's great at her job and that she's not like the Miranda Priestly prototype, um, you know, like from the Devil Wears Prada. I wanted her to be like, she looks like Miranda Priestly, but she actually does invest in her employees and um, is rooting for them and kind of, you know, has taken Poppy under her wing. Um, Cause I just think, you know, we see, we see a lot of the, the Miranda Priestly, I feel like, or we, we used to, at least, we used to see a lot of that character who's just this cold, um, intense, competitive woman. And I wanted to have this woman who's still a little cold and a little intense, but she's actually like just a fantastic boss. Well, she did seem like a real mentor. Um, Good. To her. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to do a series of a couple Perfect. rapid fire Perfect. questions, um, and then we'll end with a couple long, um, thoughtful questions again. So first rapid fire, what authors do you especially admire? 
Oh my gosh, so many. Um, Alyssa Cole, who who y'all are about to read for next month. I'm actually reading when no one is watching. That's one, but I love her romance as well. Um, Helen Huang writes really complex romance. Um, oh my gosh, Alice Hoffman is just like some of my favorite language in the world. I love Stephen King. I mean, I read everything and I just can, I just like most things. I like most <laughs> things. I like most authors. All right, this is a fun one from Joanne. Why does Pip Poppy hate to take a shower? Do you feel the same way? Yes, yes. And I don't know why I do. Um, I have wondered if I have a sensory processing disorder. It just feels like such a hassle. And I hate when my hair gets wet and I hate getting hair stuck to me. Yes, <laughs> unfortunately I do. I do it, but I don't like it. <laughs> Um, thank you for the candor um, from yes. Julie. Um, since we're here with GVH, I thought I'd ask, what's your favorite masterpiece show and have classic romances like Jane Austen influence your writing? Oh my gosh, yes. My favorite, my favorite masterpiece classic is the Colin Firth Pride and Prejudice. I have watched that so many times and I finally, finally bought it instead of just renting it like three times a year. It's like my comfort, my comfort watch and I also like love any good adaptation of Wuthering Heights I think that's you know Wuthering Heights is like so fun it's so toxic but it's like I just love it so much um so both of those are probably my top two are um Pride and Prejudice and Wuthering Heights on BBC or I think yeah Masterpiece you know you know what I'm saying the Colin yeah. Firth one <laughs> Oh yes, yeah. perfect. perfect one. Um, and then last rapid fire, do you listen to music while you write? And if so, do you match the music to the vibe of your writing? Ooh, I don't, but if I were, then I would match the music to the vibe. When I used to write like some fantasy, I would do that more. Um, but no, I love writing in silence. I can't hear lyrics without getting super distracted. So I would sometimes listen to like instrumental or like John Williams scores, but no, I'm, I'm mostly a silence writer. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So giving you a pause. That was really good rapid fire. Thank I tried. You. I was like, don't, don't go into paragraphs again. This is my problem. Um, but here's a, here's a fun one I'm going to merge to. So there was some interest in what the process it was in developing Poppy and Alex's history. Um, and then to, to, to tie onto that, like when you're in a romantic relationship, and I know you mentioned you have a husband, do you step back and observe your own relationship as research? Um, and thinking oh, about developing oh kinds of backstories. I love that so much. And it's weird because I feel like that's the relationship I would have no idea how to write. And I think that's what we were talking about, how real people are so big and unruly and characters are a way to understand like kind of parts of yourself, but really you're kind of a million different people. Um, and I think that knowing my husband so well, we've been together for like 12 years or something now, um, like my entire adult life. And that would be so, I want to write a character like him. And I also, I'm like, I don't, I have no idea if I could do that. Like, I think I might know him too well. Um, <laughs> I would have to like choose pieces of him and pieces of him do make it into the books. Um, but yeah, for, for building their dynamic, it is weird because it's really just kind of coming out of nowhere. It's like when you're writing a scene where two characters are flirting, it's like, I'm basically sitting here flirting with myself. <laughs> like it's a really like humbling experience <laughs> to write romance in some ways. Um, but but with, the, with them specifically, with Poppy and Alex, again, it was just this weird organic dream process where I didn't really know, like, you know, at the beginning of the book, they have this rift and you don't know exactly what happened. And I knew there were only like two ideas. I never was thinking like, oh, there's going to be some huge twist. I knew like there's only a couple of reasons that these people would have stopped talking and readers will know within pages, they'll kind of be like, well, it's probably this or this, you know, um, but I, I didn't know what happened. And so I was writing, you know, their front story and their backstory simultaneously, basically in the order that it ended up being published and I would get to the kind of a tipping point and I would switch to the other story and then reach kind of a cliffhanger and switch to the other story. And so it was kind of like, you know, writing together and I didn't really know what exactly happened, but as I was developing their relationship, I saw where it was going and I understood like, it's not that there's some big, I mean, there is a mystery, but it's not like there's like a real shocking twist or anything. It's just like building up why that, why what happened mattered so much and why it would affect both of them so much. 
and um, all of kind of their near misses in the course of their relationship. And I just got really lucky is how I feel where it was like, I just, I knew them so well. And I, I watched them kind of grow closer as I was writing. And I, I just felt like I didn't have to actively think too much to develop their dynamic. I just watched it grow as I was writing it. Um, but with other books, when I'm struggling more, I think a lot about how two people's like kind of childhood wounds um, will first of all, kind of set the course for their life and how they make their decisions and whatever, but also how it will put them into conflict. You know, like Alex is a caregiver. That's like this, the role he's been forced into. And Poppy um, is always just kind of like trying to escape herself and, you know, like a little bit, yeah, chaotic, like we've been talking about. And so I knew that their backstories would develop and their front story would develop and it would make sense, you know, to just see how those two wounds kind of created conflict and miscommunication and all of that. So when I'm, when I'm not having it as easy as I did writing people we meet on vacation, that's kind of my starting point is I think a lot about their childhoods and their families um, and kind of what role they filled um, and how that either sets them up to be really, really good for each other or really, really, you know, have a really, really hard time figuring out how to make things work between the two of them. You know, as you've, as you've been talking throughout the evening, it just seems like you know the characters equally, both so intimately. And it's really interesting to me because it's written in the first person from Poppy's point of view. And I know so you said you don't do character journals, yeah. um, but one question that we're having from the audience is, did you ever imagine or write parts of the book from Alex's perspective at any point? I didn't. And I think this, again, you know, I was saying like, I know my husband so well that I couldn't write him, but another piece of it is I can't ever fully know my husband, you can't ever fully know another person, which I think is what makes relationships like really special and scary and amazing and exciting is just the fact that you can't get into another person's brain completely. And that distance I think is really, it's just for some reason, it's something that we just like want to get past so badly. Um, so, so far I have never written a love story where I have done both perspectives. And that's largely because when I'm writing, I try and immerse myself so fully in the, the POV that I'm writing that I kind of need that mystery intact. Like I'm, if Poppy doesn't know for sure what's going through Alex's head, I feel like it would be very hard for, for me, at least at this stage, to see into his head and then come back to writing Poppy and fully go back into her brain. Um, so I think I, it, you know, I feel like I know them both so well, but at the same time, I think maybe I actually do know Poppy better because I think I know Alex maybe through her eyes more than I know him like in the inside of his brain, like I know her. Um, I hope someday I feel like I can try that sort of structure, but so far I have just been too scared, too intimidated. Well, you've got some kudos on the dialogue between <laughs> Poppy and Alex in the, in the chat. Um, so thinking about your books in general, do you ever go back and reread your own books once they're published? You know, the weird thing is I've only reread one of them and it's um, my my last um, YA novel, When the Sky Fell on Splendor. I, I picked it up again like this. So this is the book I was talking about. It's like my least, you know, my worst selling book. Nobody really liked it. Nobody really got it. It's my favorite thing I've ever written. And I think like a, like a few months after it came out, I had kind of had like my mourning period, which is me being very frank, just like having a book come out and this is like the common author experience. Now I'm like very, very lucky and have like the dream experience. Um, but a lot of times you kind of mourn when a book comes out because it's just like now it's the world's and the world obviously is never gonna love it. Like you love it, it's like your baby. And after a, a few months of kind of like my grieving process, I think I picked it up to be like, is this book bad? Cause like a lot of people don't like it. And I just was gonna read a couple of pages. I think I was like looking for a quote, like I was gonna do an Instagram post or something. And I accidentally just read the whole book in a day. And I, at the end of it was like, no, I still love this. And that was really, really, really healing and healthy for me to, to get to the point of, it's okay if no one else likes this, it's okay if it doesn't sell, that doesn't mean that the book is bad and it doesn't have value or wasn't worth my time. Um, and it, you know, that was really healthy because that was the last thing I did before Beach Read came out, which was of course like, a very different experience. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for that, but I'm also so grateful for my like little books that were for me and a few, you know, a select few other people. So that's the only one I've reread so far 
and it was by accident. Well, that's just delightful for the people who are, you know, writers in the in the audience. Um, so we just have um, five more minutes. So we'll wrap up with a couple questions, which is you kind of talked about this a little bit when you were talking about the genre of the book that you're in. But um, how do you feel about the chick lit category in general? And do you have any concerns about being shoehorned into that genre? Oh, yes. Um, I'm so conflicted about the chick lit genre because on the one hand, I know if I go to a shelf that is like labeled as women's fiction or chick lit or rom-com, on the one hand, it's like, I know I'm probably going to find a book about women written by women or like non-binary people, whatever. It's like, it's like a, it just feels like a very safe nook where you're like, I know what to expect. And I know it's like for me. I know that this has been made with me in mind. And that's like special, but I also, of course, think it's really sad that if, you know, so few, so few men are going to pick those books up ever. And I think that's a really sad thing that like just by nature of like my book having this cover or like being shelved in a particular place, half of the world will most likely not be super interested. Um, so I'm conflicted. It's like, yeah, I like to go to a bookstore and beeline to those shelves because I know what to expect and I know I like it, but maybe, maybe there should be a different name that is more inclusive and like, I don't know. So yeah. And then I, but I do think that the shoehorn question, I think on the one hand, I, I have no room to complain because even as like having this book be shelved as chiclet or, or romance, it's been really well received and I've gotten a lot of readers and people have been really receptive. And so it's like, I don't feel like it has harmed my career in any way it feels like it's been just great um but I also know like I am not just a romance writer and I don't say that like just a romance writer I mean I write other things beyond that and you know seeing like Alyssa Cole who's thriller um you guys are going to be reading next month um and she's done so much romance and just a little bit of everything but it's really encouraging to me to see someone be like oh and also I wrote this thriller because I I write horror, I write thrillers, I write all kinds of things and I would like to publish it all someday. Um, so yeah, I mean, I hope that people will be willing to go with me on that journey at some point, but um, there, that's always gonna be a thing when you're publishing, people are gonna kind of always gonna try and put you into a little box and be like, we understand this from you and we like this from you, so stay there. Thank you. And then just two last questions. Um, what motivated Poppy's childhood desire to be someone else? or share the consciousness of someone else? Ooh, I think that's just a thing that I have experienced. And I've, I've talked to friends too, especially honestly, my, my really extroverted friends. I have one in particular who I remember her telling me that as a kid, she would just sometimes like cry because she like would never get to be anyone else. She like would like think about her mom and be like, I'll never be her. I'll never like I don't know. I think, I think there's just weird things that as kids come into your head and you kind of forget about um, as you grow up and then you have conversations with people and you're like, oh yeah, I remember having a feeling like that. So it, I think that's just a, a kind of, it's like the, it's like the loneliness and the joy of being a human being. Like we were talking about the, the, the fact that you can never fully know someone and how that's enticing and interesting, but there is a loneliness to that. I think being like, oh, I'm just me and I can never quite get to anyone else. Thank you. And then we'll close out with a question about what's your next project? Yeah. Okay. So I know that there's going to be more information publicly soon. So I've been kind of careful about how much I share, but it is another um, sort of rom-com, you know, women's fiction, whatever that should be coming out next summer. And it is very, very, very loosely an homage in my mind to You've Got Mail. Um, but it's also really I think the thing that, that, that it started with and that I'm most excited about is it is a character who's kind of like a Swapna. And I was excited to write a character who is, you know, really like tough and intense. And so maybe the reader who said that they were scared of Swapna, you might be scared of the main character of my next book, but <laughs> I really like her. She's thorny and difficult and I really loved writing it. So yeah, there'll be more, I think in August to share. Well, that's super exciting because Swapna was my second favorite character after the cat. <laughs> oh my gosh, Flannery. Yes, that's amazing. Flannery yeah. O'Connor, the cat. Amazing. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Jen. Um, and thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in this month.
to um, Beyond the Page Book Club. And again, a special thanks to Emily Henry for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Emily. you so much. Thanks for being such a great host, April. And thank you, Jen, like you were saying, Catherine, everyone. And thank you so much to the readers who showed up. And I hope you love what when no one is watching as much as I am. So join us over the coming weeks as we take a dive into our August selection. We'll be reading When No One Is Watching, um, as Emily prefaced for us by Alyssa Cole. And the virtual conversation will take place on Thursday, August 19th at 7 p.m. Um, don't forget to also join our Beyond the Page uh, Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. Um, we look forward to connecting with you again, and we hope that you and your family are staying healthy, both physically and emotionally during this time. Thank you so much.